Good afternoon. This is Erfan Ibrahim, and welcome to the second Smart Grid Educational Series webinar for May 2014. We are very pleased to have Andres Carvalho of CMG today talking about the future role that utilities can play. And before Andres gets into his presentation, I just wanted to share with you that as many of you in the audience who are following what's going on in the electric sector, especially since 2008-2009, with uh, a lot of funding for smart grid to enable applications like distributed energy resources, uh, such as electric vehicles, storage, also renewable energy, solar, wind, other biofuels, and then the whole smart metering and the advent of AMI and what that is doing to enable customers to participate more in energy markets. At the same time in generation, there are a lot of changes that are occurring in the information technology side of centralized generation, moving a lot from analog and serial type interfaces to TCP IP based digital networks and very fast processors are being used to do real-time monitoring and control. So what this is doing is technology and business process are working in tandem uh, to support new business applications. And essentially the direction we are going in as a nation is towards more diversity in energy choices and in how we can monetize the information about energy. And there are various companies that are coming into the mix, energy service companies that are supporting utilities, independent power producers that are taking advantage of these advances in technology, both on the generation side as well as in the comm side, to provide more energy choices. So what this is doing is it's creating a paradigm shift in the electric sector. And it's really important for the entrenched businesses in this industry, which are namely the utilities, investor-owned utilities, munis, and co-ops, to all pay attention to these paradigm shifts. Because while a lot of the market is still regulated and they are essentially regulated monopolies in their area, there is a lot of competition that is developing by developing a lot of indigenous sources of energy on site. And also with uh, community-based uh, sources as well as with these independent power producers. So we don't want to see a net zero sum game in this industry. We want utilities to play an active role and participate in the paradigm shift rather than resist it or at the 11th hour do things which are not necessarily in the best interest of their shareholders or their uh, end users, essentially if you're a municipal or if you're a co-op. So what we are doing today by having Andres Carvajal come and speak on this subject is begin to discuss what utilities can potentially do. How can they leverage these paradigm shifts to help their long-term viability while at the same time providing their end customers with affordable, safe, reliable electricity. And the reason why Andres Carvajal is very unique in offering this presentation is because some 10 years ago, he started a phenomena at Austin Energy which turned into Smart Grid 1.0, 2.0, I believe they're on 3.0 now. So he has captured uh, the beginning of S-curves in our energy sector, and we're looking forward to his presentation to tell us what is this next S-curve that utilities need to be on. So with that, I, what I'm going to do is pass the presenter ball to Andres and let him take over. So Andres, the ball is in your court. <laughs> Thank you, Irfan, and I, I, I hope that I know how to do this. Uh, let me... The horizontal arrows at the top of your screen on either side of... There you go. There we yep. go. 
Well, so before I get started on anything, uh, let me go back to the title real quick. So uh, there's a lot of debate on what the future is going to look like. We're really not predicting what the future is going to look like. We are focused at CNG at uh, really driving uh, toward solutions and clearly analyzing and understanding trends and then offering solutions to our partners our customers and the ecosystem at large. Today, obviously, is a session for the world to listen. Uh, I see that Manny has joined us. So we have Bob and Manny and Irfan uh, from the CNG team online. And so the title says, Disruption Becomes Evolution. Uh, and the, the, the second part of the title is Creating the Value of Base Utilities. So let me talk real quick about the title, why I think it's important. It could have said disruption pushes evolution, disruption drives evolution. In this case, disruption will become evolution, meaning all these disruptions will actually become reality in one way, shape, or another. So the challenge for the utilities in the ecosystem at large is how to leverage them and how to adapt. Uh, and we think that the biggest transformation of all those uh, opportunities is really the one for the utility to go from being a volumetric kilowatt hour business model utility that borrows capital dollars to deploy big assets to generate kilowatt hours to one where the utility is really now focused on being a value-based services utility, selling energy services and not necessarily just kilowatt hours. So with that said, um, let me tell you for, uh, very quickly about CMG. CMG is really a brand new uh, company in the greatest scheme of things. Uh, uh, the founders of the company are uh, on the call, and there are a few that are not. Uh, and it's basically me, Orphan, Manny, uh, Vidari, Bob Barker, and uh, Andy Buckman and David Spiegel, and uh, and we are focused on uh, as a strategy consulting and advisory company on enabling smarter cities, enterprises, utilities, vendors, and startups. And the key word is clearly smarter. We are very focused on how we enable those solutions through our framework for smart design, build, run, and optimize. And the expertise of the team is on smart energy, telecommunications, and software, both on markets and technologies. And very briefly, simply the kind of things that we can do for you uh, is uh, help you with the definition and development of your strategy, assessment, your designs, your architectures, your roadmaps, your business models, your go-to-market plans, everything around IT strategy, uh, operating technology strategy and the nexus of both, and then obviously funding and M and A. Uh, about the co-authors of the paper again, Bob Barker, uh, a software expert, long long history. Andy Bugman, security expert, ex IBM. He's not on the call yet. Or at least I don't see him. Uh, myself, Irfan Ibrahim, who's a gracious host of this uh, successful series every month. Uh, David Spigler, who is a business model guru, business case guru, and Manny Vidari, who is a superstar, rock star on smart grid design and all those things related to the automation of our industry. Uh, so the agenda, very briefly, and uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll, as I understand it, the goal here is that we could have a extensive dialogue at the end, as I hope that many in the audience including people like George Kutitas uh, calling from Greece, who's uh, doing a project on a company that I sit on the board of, can chime in and participate. Um, so we're going to go through quickly the introduction of how we got here, uh, a, a bit on uh, the analysis that we have done, sort of uh, what are the driving questions of what we're trying to answer for the solutions, uh, review very quickly the technology disruptions, uh, the business disruptions, uh, have a discussion on what the utility 2.0 roadmap uh, looks like, and then have a brief discussion as a conclusion and next steps. We're not 
attempting to disclose the entire content of the white paper and cover every element. Maybe a lot of things will come up in questions uh, as they get asked, uh, but this is just a really a brief introduction of what the paper is going to cover and just walk people through it and have a, hopefully a very energized and passionate conversation. So in terms of the introduction, how do we get here? Wow, you know, it's uh, this probably of all my career, this is, I'm on my fourth career now. I started in software. I was the first product manager for Windows at Microsoft in 1986. And uh, <clears throat> I worked in computers and digital equipment, and then I worked in telecom making cell phones, and did, did several telecom startups. And and of all those industries, which are all fascinating, this one has probably the most incredible story and journey. Uh, clearly, starting with Edison and Tesla's inventions, which are, are basically at, at this moment about 32 year old. old. And, and the very first uh, a station that was created by Edison using DC technology on Pearl Street Station in 19 in 18 in 1882, uh, generating electricity for the very first time uh, on a commercial basis. Uh, that DC power uh, generate technology, as you all know very well, evolved eventually. It lasted as a predominant technology until 1890. I'm having this lecture today. And, um, and uh, AC actually took over after the Niagara project uh, when uh, basically the, trans the morphing of Edison General Electric into General Electric and merging with Westinghouse. Uh, Samuel Insel, uh, 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 assistant to uh, Edison, had moved to Chicago uh, in about 1889, uh, and he decided he was going to create, uh, you know, a, the electric utility in Chicago, if you will, uh, or the lighting company in Chicago. That was really the application at the time. And he, after several trials uh, in 1897, really in, in burning a lot of cash and, and having a lot of trials and tribulations as an entrepreneur, eventually came up with a business model, which is basically had the birth to municipalization of the electric power uh, and how uh, selling, uh, if you will, a franchise monopoly to the cities. Uh, that's how the business became came about uh, in a sustainable way, having uh, an anchor tenant and then providing services to citizens. And the interesting thing about it is that that business model was all about central generation and load factor uh, using copper wires. And interestingly enough, tier rates. Those tier rates, the, first, the uh, Insul created two tier rates, uh, an evening and a daytime, uh, the nighttime and a daytime day rate, uh, tier rates uh, in 1897. So we have been doing uh, time of use pricing, if you will, since the in inception of the, of the industry. Uh, automation uh, really came to bear uh, uh, with the first distributed control systems for power plants by, uh, by Honeywell in 75, and the first GATA and mud bus. Uh, uh, communications protocol created by Modicon in 1979. Eventually, uh, Modicon became a, a division or was acquired by Schneider Electric. Uh, and then the first energy management systems were made available by all the big boys, you know, GE, Siemens, ABB, uh, Alston, and so on in 1981. So it's, it's really roughly since, you know, 1981, we have had a lot of uh, instrumentation around power plants and, you know, bulk distribution, uh, tra transmission and distribution of the power, scale up, and then scale back down all the way to the substation. Unfortunately, the power grid, as you all know very well, has remained blind from substation to meter and beyond, you know, uh, all this time. Um, by 1980, the uh, IEEE, with several uh, members, had came up with a paper on demand response, introducing the concept and the viability as a as an application uh, to help manage the grid and the whole discussion about demand demand side management. And then the first smart meter, I'm sure you all know this, was actually introduced by GE 
using a two-way network uh, built by Metricom, I'm sure a company as many of you know about, and it was deployed by Southern California Edison in 1986, 1986. Interestingly enough, obviously, uh, you know, that that sort of first version of that reality didn't last long because Metricom was a business model, didn't make it. Uh, but it's interesting to realize that two-way smart meters had been put in place in 1986, and the technology, or if you will, the the engineering know-how to do that has been around since then. So, uh, regards to the analysis, we uh, really spend a lot of time uh, thinking about these questions, and uh, Manny Vidari suggested many of them in pushing uh, a a sort of common theme or, or filter, if you will. Uh, so basically, what are the disruption, disrupting characteristics of any change that we're going to discuss? Under what conditions do we see this becoming a threat to utilities in the business model? Uh, how do we uh, see any other industries that have gone to similar disruptions? What have they done about? And what should the utilities do to address these threats? And who are they? The, who are the leading utilities that we have handled this the best, or or are you know uh, piloting things to to to, to find the answers? Uh, what will happen if utilities do nothing or resist this push, as was uh, alluded to uh, uh, by Erfan? We're hoping the utilities will not take that position and sit back and do nothing, as our biggest fear is that they'll get um, uh, diminished. Uh, or severely impair. Uh, what is the what is and last but not least, what is the role of the regulatory regime in this equation, and what should they do to change the present situation? So those are kind of the the guiding questions of, that we use. So as we get into the disruptions, very quickly we're looking at renewable central renewable generation and distributed energy. We're looking at wholesale markets and the main response. We're looking at microgrids, electric vehicles and energy storage. So renewable energy and distributed energy. Oh, clearly renewable energy has, has been going on for a while, and the biggest thing about it is really that while a lot of people pretend that it's not happening, I could tell you by the data that I'm putting in front of you right now that it's significantly happening. So the total peak power generation of the United States is 1,100 gigawatts. That's 1,100, 1,100. And you can see now that the wind capacity is currently at 61 gigawatts, and the solar capacity is at 12 gigawatts. So combined, that is 73 gigawatts, so almost, you know, 10 percent or you know, 7 percent currently of the total uh, peak capacity of the United States. In a, really, in a few years, you know, in a, in a period of you know, 10, 15 years. And those numbers are accelerating dramatically, as you can see. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the 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 wind is growing at a very fast pace. And actually, you know, as as I get into it, uh, you know, it's really amazing to me how many records have been broken in terms of output capacity. You know, ERCA, as I put in the example here, uh, 10 gigawatts were reached on March 26th of this year, not too long ago. And on the 31st of that same month. Uh, a, a different, a slightly smaller number, but very close to 10,000 up uh, to 10 gigawatts, uh, reach 40% of the entire uh, ERCOT grid. I mean, that is just a phenomenal number when you think about uh, the fact that all the balancing that needs to be done and all the challenges of managing the the, the frequencies and modulations and uh, of the of the grid. At 40% wind penetration, but it but is it, but it's not the highest, you know. So as in the next uh, line item there, uh, in the same um, sentence uh, or or item, uh, 1.9 gigawatts uh, at Excel Energy in Colorado, and at that same day, that number achieved 61% of the mix of the grid at, at that moment. Uh, a significant large number, a, a kind of scary number when you think about it, uh, on what kind of tools can operators use to manage the reality uh, of this uh, 
penetration, this fluctuation, this intermittence, this uh, high frequency in and out uh, that is going on. Uh, in terms of solar, uh, great growth as well, you know, 41% growth, uh, the four gigawatts last year, um, in, in total installed capacity of 12 gigawatts on solar PVs or rooftops. The community, uh, uh, the uh, uh, operating capacity of centralized solar uh, at the utility level of different technologies now stands at one gigawatt. So it's really just amazing how fast, and I can tell you as an anecdotal point that uh, uh, Austin Energy has recently uh, awarded uh, a purchase power agreement, PPA, to a company called uh, Revert Energy uh, out of California, a contract that had, had been initially awarded to Sun Edison, but it got uh, changed because of the pricing and as I understand it unofficially, uh, that pricing is 4.5 cents per kilowatt for a 30-year contract on 150 megawatts. Four and a half cents per kilowatt for solar on a PPA. That means that they can make it for a lot less than that and still make money to sell it. That's just, that's just a mind-boggling number when you consider where solar was five, ten years ago in terms of cost. Um, and then a distributed energy, an incredible disruptive force coming to us very soon. Uh, it's been around for a long time. There's really nothing new about cogeneration and reciprocal engines and micro-grass turbines and micro-wind turbines, even though those uh, micro-wind turbines are not as popular as the prior two. But the fact that uh, customers can reduce their dependence on utilities and lower their carbon footprint by choice, uh, that they can actually potentially create a paradigm where they can do peer-to-peer -peer energy trading, meaning selling their excess green electrons to their favorite family member, their favorite friend. Um, and this is an essence of the premise of uh, Georgia's company, uh, Gridmates, which is building a transactive energy platform uh, where he can enable this on a global scale, uh, partnering with utilities and customers. Uh, and, and obviously the last element here that, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, by producing uh, energy, by, by turning yourself from a consumer to a producer, uh, called by Alvin Toffler a prosumer, uh, you can now participate in the market and perhaps, you know, earn revenue stream from ancillary services back to the utility uh, and at the same time also hardening the grid and the resiliency of it uh, around outages and frequency management and all those things because your distributed generation can be dispatched by the utility and leverage as part of the whole ecosystem. Very fascinating uh, reality. Uh, utility, a lot of utilities are not uh, participating in this today, uh, but they're basically, uh, uh, basically they are, uh, you know, uh, exploring a lot of this. Uh, clearly some companies are aggressively uh, blending from being generation companies into uh, owning uh, retail and, and planning to including the uh, electric vehicle infrastructure. So a na name that comes to mind would be NRG, Energy. Uh, and, and because of what they're doing and how they're going about it, they're actually uh, being perceived an incredibly disruptive force. But I think that, you know, they're doing a great service to the industry by showing the way. Uh, in many ways. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're the only ones, though. There are other companies that I would put uh, in the leadership position of, of uh, building uh, and leveraging wind and solar and distributed energy. Clearly, Nextera Energy is the largest producer of wind power uh, in the U.S., uh, and then companies like San Diego Gas and Electric uh, and Southern Cal Edison and Austin Energy are um, leveraging solar PVEs in a big way in addition to buying wind, uh, wind power. 
uh, on the next trend, which I think is also a very interesting one, because if you recall, uh, demand response was introduced to, to the planet in 1980 by the IEEE and a white paper. Uh, and so as wholesale markets and demand response intersect and market operators uh, look for new tools to deal with the intermittence and the challenges of uh, of the of the um, you know green and generation from wind and solar, uh, clearly it makes a lot of sense to turn on to demand response, not a not the current demand response, vanilla demand response that we know, but but uh, but really the the you know the fact that a dynamic demand response, one where uh, you could potentially manage every device, every load, every consuming device in the grid on the other side of the meter, and you could actually cycle them off or turn them off at will would be a phenomenal uh, opportunity for providing uh, operators and the grid at large with a escape valve, if you will, sort of like a pressure cooker with a escape valve of being able to maintain that uh, even keel pressure or frequency in this case. Uh, to 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 do it for many reasons to to help with the you know uh, congestion to help it with peak peak to help it with you know uh, achieve shifting to help it with uh, you know flattening pricing uh, and all kinds of capabilities and so today we really don't have a dynamic demand response environment but if we did. Uh, it, it would be fantastic what could be what could be done. Obviously, we see a lot of this already uh, uh, about um, you know ac accelerating the pace towards a dynamic demand response in places like the PJM uh, territory. Uh, now, one of the it's in, interesting enough PJM, which uh, leverages demand response in a big way is doing it for other reasons more than for dealing with wind, even though wind is a, is clearly a, a challenge for them in a certain way. Uh, you know, the wind number, penetration numbers, the peak numbers at, at PGM are not that large compared to the other regions. Uh, their highest peak is five gigawatts. And the highest uh, mix of the generation that that represented at any time the last time being January 20th of 2013 was only 7% of their mix. So, so compared to Excel reaching 60% or California reaching 18% or Bonneville Power Authority reaching 40% mix, uh, similar with ERCOT Texas with 40%, uh, you know, the 7% the of PJM is not a big challenge yet. But you, know, you can tell that they are uh, aggressively leveraging other tools and kind of preempting uh, and solving other challenges they have as, as the Northeast is more of a demand constraint and they import a lot of Jews from, uh, from Canada. Um, so interestingly enough, again, we can see that while the technologies have been around for a while and they were introduced and have evolved, um, they're not fully deployed, right? And, and and I go back to that element of the grid has been blind from the substation to the meter and beyond the meter. And I think it's time, given the technologies that we have and all the advances that we enjoy from microprocessors and solid state membrane and wireless networks and fiber and things like MPLS all running on IP. And then when you add all those things on top of cloud services and big data, that the, you know the time has come to really make that other part of the grid uh, fully visible, fully actionable, fully controllable, fully manageable. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, you know uh, there's a lot of discussions about what other trends and what else is going to happen. That how how much more difficult could it get? And so there is another trend, very interestingly called microgrids, which is really starting to grow. It's not very large yet, uh, but it's really starting to impact what's going on. And to give you a sense of it, uh, I can tell you that, uh, you know, the largest microgrid being deployed in the United States is at Hudson Yards in New York City. And it's roughly six blocks, six city blocks, 17 million square feet, 5,000 apartments, 
200 shops, 50 restaurants, one cultural center, uh, all powered by 13.2 megawatts of independent uh, microgas turbines and reciprocal engines that are using the grid uh, provided by Con Ed as a backup. But but there but it's a black star deployment, and if Manhattan were to go dark, uh, the Hudson Yards uh, section of Manhattan will be up and lit up and functioning with no problems whatsoever. And this is a this is a big, in my opinion, a big uh, testament of the of the advancement of the technology, the capability of the technology, and the reality that. Uh, we have, uh, if you will, all the building blocks to to enable a much more robust, sophisticated grid that doesn't have to go 100% down when a storm like Sandy or Katrina or, or any of those come around and wipes out and, and, and takes down hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles of wires that are still floating in the air. Uh, that at you know 40 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour can easily be uh, latched. So uh, it's really clear to me that microgrids play a significant role in in in, in you know uh, customer segments that uh, around government buildings. You probably know very well the Department of Defense has a mandate to get all their uh, operating bases uh, off the grid by 2024. Uh, so that's not very far from now. Uh, and the, the industrial and commercial sector, especially hostels, uh, food stores, factories, uh, pro food processing factories, uh, are, are looking aggressively and going aggressively off the grid, including uh, even hostels and in some cases schools uh, and churches. Uh, and so it's really fascinating to see uh, what's going on. There, are, we are at CMG is involved in about seven microgrid projects right now in in the nation. Uh, and I think that you know the key reasons are you know understandably the right to choose your power source, uh, the, the 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 ability to have total power security because you need it because. You, you know, you are Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley. And your disaster recovery building in New Jersey versus the one you have in Manhattan needs to be off the grid and, and functioning 24-7. In some cases, because you need better reliability, uh, a lot of data centers are looking at microgrids uh, to basically uh, have a better solution uh, for quality of power, which is becoming more and more of a big issue. Uh, going forward uh, as, you know, depending on your location on the grid, if you're at the tail end of the grid, uh, depending on the distance between you and that and that uh, last substation, uh, you can be having a lot of modulation and frequency challenges if you require six nines or seven nines of purity um, uh, in, your, in your delivery. Uh, the next uh, disruptive technology that we're looking at, and, and we are going to get into the solutions uh, in the paper uh, and share some with you here, uh, is energy storage. And clearly, energy storage is the holy grail. And, uh, and uh, you know, if, if everything was, uh, you know, perfect and, and, and innovation could happen at the pace that we wanted it tomorrow, Clearly, energy storage could come in and save the day, and you could see how you know they could uh, an energy storage solution at a substation or somewhere placed on the grid, you know that maybe next to my transformer that feeds three houses in my neighborhood, or at the feeder level could do things like voltage support and reactive power support and power factor correction and power quality enhancement. And clearly, at the at the bulk bigger level, you know things like frequency regulation and ancillary services, and obviously, you know things that we have been doing with pump hydro or thermal storage for a long time, flattening or shifting the load profile, you know, and and really, uh, you know, potentially, you know, uh, 
changing the way or the challenge or diminishing the challenges of uh, of congestion, you know, traffic congestion uh, at the nodes on the grid because, you know, unfortunately, uh, demand and supply are not equally um, distributed. Uh, energy storage could enable the cap capability married to distributed generation in a very you know, fundamentally architected way, create something incredibly uh, resilient, incredibly sustainable, and inexpensive, uh, abundant power uh, at, a, at a fraction of the cost. Um, the, the other thing, obviously, that energy storage could help with is the whole support of the inter intermittent generation uh, resources like wind and solar that we've discussed. Uh, in many ways, right? And then last but not least, you know, by leveraging uh, distributed generation on the other side of the meter and energy storage, you can also, you know, reduce or, you know, defer or push into the future or leverage your assets a little longer around your transmission and distribution capital investments. So we, you know, clearly there's a lot of challenges with storage, the latest numbers, we work with a couple of storage companies at CNG, uh, and we're very much in the middle of the industry and what's going on. And, and the price is really what's killed the solution over time. Um, we definitely are looking at uh, the reality that you know the price to beat is a natural gas peaking uh, engine, uh, you know, at roughly four hundred fifty thousand dollars per per megawatt uh, for capital deployment. Uh, and storage is sitting today anywhere from, depending on who you talk to, uh, anywhere from uh, $900,000 to $2 million bucks, uh, regardless of the technology, flow batteries, leaking ion, uh, zinc, uh, nitrate, whatever they are. Uh, and so the interesting thing about all that is that clearly breakthroughs are being worked on, innovation is happening. Uh, but, you know, one of the challenges that the industry has at large, especially on deregulated markets, is that wires guys are not allowed to use storage in their grids because storage is considered a generation asset. I mean, so that is something that radically needs to be uh, improved and, and, and changed nationwide and globally, for that matter, uh, so that energy storage could be used uh, as, a, as a store a store release um, facility uh, by any grid operator anywhere within their uh, infrastructure without uh, being considered a generation entity and having to play by those rules. The next uh, huge uh, tra uh, Im impact on this that is, 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 a, is a flavor of energy storage is really electric vehicles, and, and, and this is just energy storage on wheels, literally, no pun intended. Uh, and, and the interesting thing about it is that, you know, we have been here before. Electric vehicles are not new. There were more electric vehicles at one point before there were, uh, you know, combustion gas engines uh, and the, the Model T4 was invented. Uh, and then we um, did uh, a lot of electric vehicle stuff again in the 70s and in the 80s, and and they, they all failed miserably. Um, um, for all kinds of reasons, uh, you, you know, you could argue that there is, you know, conspiracy theories about those, but, but regardless of that, you know, here we are, and uh, you know, there were 100,000 electric vehicles uh, sold last year, uh, and uh, or no, I'm sorry, the install base of electric vehicles is 100,000 units last year total. I think the Tesla guys sold roughly uh, above 10,000 units, uh, and then there are other players, obviously. The you know, um, and so the interesting thing about electric vehicles, in my opinion, is that it provides sort of the 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 have you cake and eat it too scenario with storage, because again, these vehicles move around, people drive them two hours a day, and they park for 22 hours somewhere at the home at the office or maybe at the airport parking lot. And and uh and while they could represent some challenges uh because if they're not their charging is not coordinated, uh you could have some serious issues with your infrastructure, a bit of fireworks at the transformer level, a lot of melting going on, 
potentially some people could get hurt. Uh, and the interesting thing about that is that the concentration for that is, is not a huge number, right? I mean, how many how many electric vehicles, how many Teslas at 85 kilowatt hour batteries would it take to melt the transformer outside my house? You know, four, five, six charging at the same time. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't take uh, a 1% penetration of the U.S. vehicle market for electric vehicles to really create the problem that utilities should be all over in terms of coordinating and managing these assets, even though they don't belong to them. Uh, and, and obviously, if you think about how wonderful it could be if they could be managed, and there was a mechanism for that, perhaps price signals, what a, what a great way of doing it in a capitalist country. Uh, that, you know, uh, these vehicles could be leveraged. Uh, so, for example, when we were doing Pecan Street Project in 2009, we did a lot of modeling, and uh, the city, the greater city of Austin has roughly 150,000 vehicles running around. And we were assuming that at, at the time that uh, you know, the batteries would be in the 10 kilowatt hour order, and obviously, as I said earlier, you know, Teslas are 85 kilowatts, and they're talking about even bigger uh, um, numbers than those for the current models, for the coming models. And But let's assume for a moment that the batteries are 10 kilowatt hours, and all we would need is 40% penetration of electric vehicles in Austin out of the 850,000, or roughly 300,000 vehicles to achieve the same generation capacity that we have on, on at Austin Energy of 3,000 megawatts to have it store on vehicles all across the service territory. Now, the interesting thing about that is that it's not 10 kilowatt hour batteries. They're more like 100 kilowatt hour batteries when it's all said and done, and perhaps bigger than that. But if they're t 100 kilowatt hour batteries, so you don't need 40% penetration. You only need 30,000 cars out of, you know, 850,000. So, you know, a very attainable number. And how many people think that it's possible that by 2020 there will be, you know, 100,000 electric vehicles in Austin? Or, you know, by 2030 there will be, you know, 300, you know, a, a larger number than that. And so... So today, as I understand it, there are roughly 200, 200 Teslas in Austin. Uh, the, the uptake is pretty fast, uh, and all other uh, electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids of those kind are running around. And so it's very likely that uh, we will see 30,000 vehicles with 100 kilowatt hour batteries running around pretty soon, enabling Austin Energy to create a program to basically uh, do all kinds of fancy things by leveling the the uh, load curves and, and 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 dealing with congestion and 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 all kinds of issues that the grid has today that could be leveraged and managed properly, not entirely by charging or discharging every battery as it shouldn't be understood that that would be the goal or the method, but by using those batteries at five percent of their a capacity or three percent of their capacity at any given time, and when you add them all together, you you know you get a significant number uh, that really makes uh, you know a disruptive um, uh, advantage uh, you know turns a disruption into an advantage the the utility can leverage. In terms of the business disruptions, and I'm going to accelerate here. Uh, there are retail choice, municipalization, and nationwide wholesale market, new business models. So retail choice is very simple. This is all about competition. You probably know that there are uh, what's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen states with competition. There's a typo that I just see there uh, between two, the year 2000 and year 2002. And those states offer uh, electric deregulation competition. Uh, internationally, Australia, New Zealand, and Western Europe are all uh, in competition uh, from the years 98 through 2003. Uh, they all adopted it. And interestingly enough, the, what's going on with uh, retail choice primarily is that the, you know competition fosters innovation and 
and, and so on and so on and so on. And it's sort of like a self-fulfilling prophecy of more services and cheaper prices uh, because of the nature of capitalism. And so it's not, not, not crazy to realize that competitive markets show significant technology and business model innovation. So, for example, I don't know how many of you know, but you can get free power on evenings and free power on weekends in Texas from several retailers if you sign up with their contracts. Can you imagine free power for the evening and the weekends? Who would I ever thought, right? Let alone the fact that you can get real-time pricing, time of use pricing, and just about anything you like. More interestingly enough, you know, not only internationally, which is happening in Australia, in the UK, and New Zealand, but it's also happening now in Dallas, you know, where Comcast is bundling power with their voice, data, and wireless services. Uh, in, 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 in Australia, New Zealand, and in the UK, you have some providers that are bundling, on top of those four, they're bundling water and gas. So think what that means. Think about what that means in terms of the disruption. I mean, first of all, what prevents Verizon, Comcast, Time Warner, AT&T, Google, or anybody else to become a retail energy provider at the, uh, the, on the deregulated markets? But more importantly, if kilowatt hours is not the only tool to be selling on, as an energy service provider, is you can actually be selling energy efficiency or you can actually be selling distributed generation behind the meter. Well, what prevents any of the current retail energy providers to start selling in every state, in every service territory, those energy services, even though they are banned from selling kilowatt hours from the grid? They could be still selling kilowatt hours on your side of the meter and selling you energy efficiency services and selling you voice and selling you data and selling you wireless and water and gas all bundle. And so what is that going to do to the landscape is in a fascinating question. Uh, there's all kinds of things to be thinking about. On a different trend that is also happening at the same time, uh, one called municipalization, uh, several cities and municipalities seem to continue, uh, that's another typo that I see there, seem to continue to have different sustainability and customer responsibilities uh, uh, values uh, uh, with their current vendors. We know the story very well publicized of Boulder and Excel Energy, an unfortunate reality, but it's happening. We've also heard many times about Moran County, Sonoma County wanting to claim independence from PG&E, and there are many more examples of this. Interestingly enough, in, in doing our research for this paper, uh, we found out that, in fact, every state in the nation allows their cities and municipalities to become their own public power owners by ceasing control. And, in fact, um, cities and municipalities could declare uh, those power assets currently in their uh, uh, property, uh, uh, they could condemn them and buy them at the lowest possible price from the owners of the power company at the time and then turn them into their own assets to become the provider. Interesting fact that I didn't know about. Uh, after doing exhaustive research, uh, we discovered that and have read all the the briefs from all the municipalities across the United States. And this is a reality that I think more and more will pursue perhaps uh, because it clearly provides a different paradigm shift in terms of the services uh, that um, uh, can be offered uh, because, you know, most of the cities own or municipalities own their water and obviously public works and health services and so on. So. So it's share services, share infrastructure is really an a, a economic driver for the trend <clears throat> towards leveraging distributed generation and distributed energy resources. <clears throat> Maybe municipalization is a, a vehicle <clears throat> that will pick up <clears throat> more speed. <clears throat> Pardon me. We we need a 
we need a nationwide wholesale market, in my opinion. <clears throat> there is a lack of national coordination on integrated resource plans, on uh, <clears throat> renewable portfolio standard goals, and on um, integrated retail markets with demand response, energy storage, and distributed generation <clears throat> that make us, at least right now in the U.S., inefficient and ineffective. <clears throat> An aging workforce is also looming, and infrastructure uh, <clears throat> aging is also looming. And these two things also accelerate the weaknesses of our current system of being incredibly fragmented, not well coordinated, <clears throat> and to a certain degree, inefficient. Uh, you probably realize that uh, central generation, <coughs> with all its virtues, it really only has a 50% return on equity as uh, assets are built for peak and um, consumption, you know, peak, peak achievement of peak only happens in, in a few days of the year. And so that creates a, a sound capital cost that needs to be built around transmission and, and power generation that uh, as we continue to grow population and we need to continue to grow the demand of uh, quality of power and challenges on the grid, uh, it becomes, you know, more and more ineconomical, unfortunately, uh, on the asset side, investment and capital costs up front. Uh, and then, you know, the interesting thing about this is that regardless of that, you know, and, and I don't want to uh, make you walk away thinking that, I'm on, the, we are only predicting that that um, the future is around the edge and generation on the edge is not. It's a hybrid. <clears throat> and the challenge is on that hybrid, sort of like how you fine tune that race car engine, uh, that carburetor and that Formula One, how do you fine tune that machine? Uh, and that's the challenge. Today we've had more of a set it and forget it system that we could afford. And now we're moving with technology and complexity, unfortunately or fortunately, into a reality that requires, you know, more innovation to solve the complexity that we have already created uh, and streamline, uh, uh, you know, cost and uh, increase uh, at the same time services, availability, quality, and so on. So, so at the end, uh, how can how can we create the construct, if you will, that uh, safeguards the investments needed to have bulk power? Because you know, as as, as uh, Roger Duncan once said in a meeting at Austin Energy, even though he was Mister Renewable Energy, he said, "You know, guys, we can go 100% renewable, but at some point we need to melt steel to make the blades for the wind farms <coughs> and wind energy." is not going to be able to melt the steel 24-7. So we're going to need to keep some of that 24-7 stuff. So it's interesting that um, um, <clears throat> that that trend, it's a, it's a reality. Uh, and, and then in terms of business models uh, that we are looking at, uh, clearly there is a lot to discuss here, and I probably defer to the, to the conversation where we're at, but um, – we believe that you know the Brattle Group did a great job of introducing the um, smart integrator paradigm and the energy service utility paradigm beyond the traditional vertically integrated monopoly, if you will. <clears throat> and we believe that there's another element that we call the energy as a service paradigm, in which uh, you know the, the deregulated, dynamic, and distributed. Uh, emerges as a significant force, uh, and we're not saying that that you know one size fits all, and there is a silver bullet here. We actually believe that the four constructs are going to to exist uh, depending on where you come from and depending on the reality of your resources. If you're more hydro, or if you need to need to move away from coal, or if you can leverage the sun or the wind, you know, again, geographically speaking, all those realities are different everywhere, and not all not all solutions uh, fit the same, and so, uh, but we believe that there will be a huge push and a huge emergence 
on a new business model of companies becoming energy as a service providers. And maybe this is where the the Googles and the Verizons and the AT&Ts and the NRGs of the future fit in and are striving for, and they play a role here uh, on competitive markets, on deregulated, and focusing on uh, distributed, uh, distributed nature of generation and obviously leveraging um, you know, megawatts, uh, if you will, on, with the concept of a virtual power plant or what, I, what we call sometimes uh, demand response on steroids. Uh, in terms of the utility roadmap, we don't really want to give you a lot here right now because we want you to read the paper. But this is the this is the picture that really drives the madness, if you will, the disruption uh, that the utilities need to figure out how to play with. Do they own the assets on the other side of the meter, just like they did in the early days, uh, and lease them back uh, or make them make make them back, uh, you know, recover the cost as as a service, uh, sort of like the cable guys do and the telco guys do with their set top boxes. You don't buy the set top box, you pay a monthly fee kind of thing. So what if uh, Austin Energy were to buy a thousand Teslas and lease them back into the service territory and then use a thousand Teslas in a vehicle to grid, grid to vehicle, they didn't have to worry about it. Warranty, they didn't have to deal with Tesla, they could do whatever they wanted. So there's all kinds of interesting realities of how to build this roadmap and how to get there and the business models behind it. Uh, in terms of conclusions and next steps, and then we get into a dialogue. Sorry, I'm taking longer than I thought I was going to take, Irfan. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> in terms of conclusions and next steps, to be brief, we believe that regulators should explore seriously and aggressively allowing utilities to invest in R&D and new customer offerings, which they don't. Uh, everything that the utility does needs to show recovery and a payback uh, to the utility and their customers or shareholders. Uh, uh, regulators should explore compensating utilities for building a two-way power flow smart grid that enables prosumers. As you probably know, while there are some smart grid mandates, I mean uh, smart meter mandates, and there are some demand response mandates and renewable portfolio standard mandates, there are no smart grid mandates anywhere. Uh, so nobody is being mandated to build a two-way power flow smart grid that enables a prosumer, meaning somebody who owns solar, natural gas, turbines, uh, electric vehicles, and energy storage in their house and wants to sell that energy back to the grid. Uh, we also believe that regulators should explore retail choice nationwide, and the way to fund that would be uh, and compensate those who own retail choice that don't want to give it up is by basically allowing a privatization, just like we saw it in the telco model, uh, and allowing uh, four to six uh, uh, companies per service territory uh, to bid for those services. And then the funds raised from that could be used uh, in some percentage for rebuild out of the transmission distribution grid into that two-way power flow grid and also improve the bulk generation adequacy mechanisms that would pr protect and guarantee that central generation continues because, as I said earlier, if everybody jumps away from central generation, we won't be able to melt the steel to make the wind turbines that we all want supposedly so badly. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, we also think that utilities must invest much, much more, significantly much more. I cannot emphasize how much more they need to invest in product marketing, consumer marketing, staff, and best practices to truly become service-oriented, customer-centric, energy service providers instead of selling kilowatt hours. Uh, <clears throat> and then we also believe that in order to get there, utilities must build a strategic plan and a roadmap for all use cases that we have discovered, discussed, and, and disruptions that we have discussed, and business models that we will discuss in the paper so that they can truly chart a path that is optimal for them uh, understanding all the realities and all the variables and all the advantages and all the innovations and not just pick the next cool project because the CEO sat in the, in the plane in first class talking to so-and-so or picked up a magazine so an ad about some cool thing. Uh, hopefully, you know, uh, and I'm not saying that that's how it happens all the time, but, you know, I think that accidental empires have been happening a lot and we would like to uh, create a more purposely driven future around a 
utility uh, reality that uh, is sustainable. Uh, it's integrated into uh, in leveraging all the disruptions to the best of their capabilities, given their realities and affordabilities and geographical locations and so on. And so with that said, Arfan, I will uh, i don't know if I can turn it back to you. What do I do? Just move the ball back to you? Is that what I'm supposed to It's fine. I'll take care of that. Thank you very much. And at this point, what I'll ask uh, Bob Barker and Mani to do is if you go ahead and unmute so you can be available as a resource. And there we go. Bob Barker also. Yeah. So as we uh, ask the folks uh, to uh, post their questions online, I mm -hmm. want to invite uh, Mani to share a few thoughts, and then I'll ask Bob the same. So go ahead, Mani. Thank you, Arfan. Uh, this is Mani Badari here. I think I think one of the biggest things we are saying here uh, to add to what uh, Andres uh, said so. Um, you know, so well, is that we believe, actually, or, or we, is that we do not believe in the uh, comment that's going out there which says, you know, the utilities are doomed and utilities will not survive and things like that. We actually believe that there is a serious opportunity here for utilities to continue to have relevance, to continue to have a role to play. And it's really up to them and the regulators to define what's the best path forward. So we have given that roadmap in the white paper that helps them drive what is the best path forward. Wonderful. Okay, thanks, Mani. And Bob? Yes, so if, if you remember the... Uh, the chart that we talked about that shows supply chain integration and distributed generation being drivers in uh, defining the different business models that the utilities can take. Um, we, in, in all our conversations and what's going to be in the paper, we talk a lot about that there has to be a conscious uh, decision making on the process, on the part of the utilities to de to find that for their specific case, what's their roadmap? How are they going to get to um, the place they need to be in the future in order to take advantage of and leverage the things that are going on in the industry. And there's there's a lot of reward there, but there's all, a lot of risk involved as well. And so, you know, assessing that risk versus reward equation is going to be um, the real challenge in order to determine whether, you know, how fast and whether and in what forms you move toward becoming a service-based and a value-based utility. Thank you, Bob. There were a couple of people who were on the phone, but they're shown as unknown callers. So I'm just checking to see if Andy Bachman or Dave Spigler are on the phone. Okay. Since they're not, we will now move to the questions that are being posted online. So let's go there. Let's start with... Uh, Okay. First of all, Murti Devakaruni asked from iGate, he asked, are utilities now working to partner with municipalities, cities to encourage microgrids in selected areas in an attempt to develop new business models for the utility future? Andres, you want to take that? Yeah, so, so the answer is yes. So the Hudson Yards project in New York is a collaboration between the City of New York and Con Ed. Uh, Consolidated Edison and several private uh, stakeholders that are putting the money to build the Hudson Yards project, and 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 there are similar things going on in other areas like that. At the same time, the opposite is occurring too, where there's a bit of a standoff going on in many places. But uh, but uh, the, are there any uh, 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 partnerships uh, being forward? The answer is yes. Uh, and the biggest ones are being driven around the biggest projects. So anywhere there is a Department of Defense base that is going to go off the grid by 2024, those utilities and those cities will have to deal with that partnership. 
next question from Paul Heitman asks, how does the full impact of this play out? The court ruling issued in the case Electric Power Supply Association versus FERC Commission, it's a 44-page PDF document, and it vacates order number 745 and remands it back to the commission. So I guess you would have to have read this document. He provides also a link. Do you have any thoughts on this, Andres or Mani? Or yeah, so, so, yeah, this just happened. Again, I think it's that temporary, uh, you know, I mean, th is the main response dead? No, I don't think so. You know, I mean, you know, I think that, uh, you know, again, we're we're not saying, uh, we're not advocating that one size fits all. And I think that that's part of the understanding that needs to go on here. Uh, we tend to be very serial of, you know, a, a, a sort of one 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 task at a time kind of, decision making process we need to be more orchestrating and understanding all the variables and and so so again we're not advocating the central generation needs to be eliminated uh the opposite uh we need to uh we need to actually harden that way the system and and improve the system but we also need to understand that there are some innovations and they give us some tools that we need to leverage like demand response like distributed generation so so i think that part of the challenge is the way decisions are being made and the way cases are tried in the law and, and the way regulators uh, sort of swallow innovation and make decisions are are not fit, are, are not able to keep up with the, the complexity of the reality that we are heading into. And so this is part of the notion of why we're creating the white paper uh, that it is, will be followed up with uh, you know, uh, in-depth uh, uh, capabilities to help uh, cities and enterprises and, and utilities uh, actually build those roadmaps and, and arrive to the solutions. Because we we collectively have been there, have have been worked in many of these scenarios, and have great expertise on how this complex thinking needs to be simplified and articulated and presented in a better way in order to really uh evolve uh you know systematically and and in harmony okay uh, andres if i orfan if i may add um this is not the only setback that's going to happen uh we can also point to uh, yesterday's uh, or day before yesterday's barons downgrading of the utility sector as well we're going to see a lot of these things happen because we are kind of going into what, what Irfan, I think you introduced us and Andres actually connected to. Uh, we're going into somewhat uncharted waters here. So <clears throat> you take on one side, uh, Barron's downgrading the utility sector. You take the uh, uh, rejection of demand response. Uh, I think we will have some rocky, uh, we'll have a rocky road ahead, uh, but I believe uh, we need to be looking at all of these things, and they will all impact us, and I think we will continue to move forward, and we will continue to tackle all of these things appropriately. Right, and along those lines, uh, I would like to say that electricity is like water or like gas coming to your home. It's not like the Internet, and it's not like telephone. Uh, this is uh, essentially life-supporting. So the reliability of the grid or the delivery to customer prem is critical. You cannot just sit for hours and hours in an industrialized society without electricity. And whenever we've tried to, we've had a lot of uh, social problems and, and other law enforcement problems. So the net result is that we need to move forward. We need to provide choices to uh, customers. Uh, we need to be able to form microgrids and all of that. But at the same time, we need to look at the whole picture. What are we doing as far as national security is concerned? Are we truly moving to a more reliable overall electric system with more resiliency, not only against terrorist type attacks or system errors, but also the increasing frequency of natural disasters? So some people in the industry have to maintain that systemic view and make sure we're not moving in a direction from which there is no U-turn allowed, that we are constantly 
opening up opportunities. And that's, I think, a big part of this white paper is to create a dialogue for diversity and not to look for things as panacea. Agreed. All right, so we have a couple more uh, comments. One comes from David Mollerstein, who says, Andres characterized the municipalization effort in Boulder as unfortunate. Can you expand on that? Somewhat surprising given his Austin energy pedigree. I didn't know it was a DNA thing. <laughs> I thought you were just working there, uh, Andres. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I would. Your DNA. <laughs> I call it. I call it unfortunate because um, you know a lot of the guys. Uh, so, so if you if you remember the history of the smart grid, uh, Excel Energy and Austin Energy were really the two contending companies pushing the smart grid concept in 2004, 2005, and and. Um, and uh, I remember sitting down with Excel guys and, and pretty much making a bet that I would finish building the grid in Austin before they could build it in Boulder. And, you know, we know that we know who won that bet. But uh, but it, I call it unfortunate because, you know, because, they you know, they everybody had great intentions of doing the right thing. But unfortunately, things didn't play out the way they played out in Austin and in Boulder. And, um so that's why I call it unfortunate. So I'm not the, the, my comment does has nothing to do with uh, picking, uh, you know, or judging on the decision of Boulder wanting to walk away from Excel. I think that that's again, as I as I as I educated myself over the last 30 days uh, 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 on this in, in a very deep way. Every city in America, every municipality in America, by law, per each state. Is statutory in the law in the state has the right to seize this, the assets of an electric company and work out a deal and become their own public power company. Right. And so nothing wrong with that. It's in the law. Yeah, I, and I'm glad that we are going in this part of the our discussion space because I think that it will be very difficult for utilities to change their business model unless they have a partner in the regulatory side. Quite That's often, right. over the years, the regulatory framework has been fragmented between environmentally conscious people who are getting the pressure from consumer groups to bring in all kinds of subsidies and bring in all types of renewable energy and other things, while there's another group within the regulatory framework that's trying to protect the interest of the utilities and making sure that they remain viable. The result is there's confusion in the market. I think it would be much better if the regulatory framework acted as a catalyst to bring utilities and customers together on a common framework. That means create policies that not only that are really a win-win situation. Decouple, for instance, the kilowatt hours from revenue. So utilities don't feel like there's a net zero sum game going on with customer prem production of energy. Improved energy efficiency, give incentives. You know, California is a good example where they've done the decoupling and are promoting energy efficiency. And you see utilities have a very different mindset here towards DER and other things than other parts of the country. So I think the regulatory framework needs to get modified along with the utility business model. Yeah. All right, so we have Mike Marullo who says, a lot of these setbacks are simply underscoring the archaic state of our century-old regulatory environment. Hmm, I feel like there's a deja vu here. <laughs> 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 so uh, let's uh, continue and see if there are some more uh, questions uh, in the Q&A part. Okay, let's see here. Uh, yes, William Miller says, Erfan, can you ask the speakers to summarize constraints and lack of agreement for meeting in every state? It is hard to see how to resolve this problem if we do not clearly understand why it has not happened to this point. Resolution needs to be in stages. Agreed. Agreed. And I think that that's part of, uh, that's part of the process that we're suggesting on the roadmap. 
uh, and part of in its in its, in its uh, uh, you know it will, it will be outlined in our in our conclusions and insights. So stay tuned for the paper. Okay, I think I have a question for Bob Barker, and the question is from Murti Divakaruni. Why do you think Warren Buffett is buying utilities? And what is Google's possible next intent of buying Nest? Um, with respect to Warren Buffett, you know, if I were smart enough to figure out why he does things, I would be incredibly wealthy already. But um, what what I think is, in this case, what he may be doing is he may be seeing the uh, premature demise that's being talked about, about the utilities, and then he's going back and looking at just basic, the incredible basic financial fundamentals of the utilities and saying that they're undervalued at this point. That's my only guess. Um, and I'm not really sure, to be totally honest, I'm not sure what Google's intent is going to be with buying Nest. I mean, they're, you know, they're known for putting their fingers in any place they can where uh, they can gather data and generate data, and certainly Nest would give them a way of aggregating an incredible amount of data uh, related to usage. What they'll do with it, I'm not sure. So one of the possibilities uh, for utilities and how they can adopt microgrid is that they have the deep pockets and the large service territories. And they can bring economies of scale to microgrid deployment in a way that a small company setting up a microgrid cannot, because there is a common administrative cost over the whole thing. So while sure. the infrastructure is distributed, but if it's under a canopy of a common management and deep pocket, I think there's a type of economies of scale in microgrid that we're not realizing in the consumer market today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I, if I can if I can add two comments to the Warren Buffett thing, I think that and Bob uh, basically said it without saying his words. But by Warren Buffett not only investing in the utility industry, but if you have realized after after uh, you know he had invested in Mid America a while back, uh, because again it's a you know he likes cash flow, he likes cash flow businesses and utilities print money. Uh, but after he bought in the energy in Las Vegas, he changed the name of the company to to Berkshire Hathaway Energy. Now, why would somebody so successful go out of their way to change their name of their on the front door of one of the many companies that he owns if he didn't think that he was going to be doing this for a long time and perhaps he was going to continue to buy them until he became the first nationwide company? It reminds me of the late 1920s and the early 30s when certain families bought a lot of cheap stock on Wall Street. Yeah. yeah. Now it should it should go without it shouldn't go without mention also that uh, uh, Exelon, which is actually the largest utility in the United States, they own Constellation, Pico, Commonwealth Edison in Chicago, and Baltimore Gas and Electric just uh, purchased Pepco. Which was another six million, uh, three million uh, customers in the D.C. area, and, and and now they stand tall as the largest uh, conglomerate of generation and retail energy. And then you also know that Nextera Energy, which is the largest wind producer in the United States, owns Florida Power and Light. And then Duke Energy, uh, it's in several states, and they merged with Progress Energy, which was in South Carolina, North Carolina, and Florida. And so those those four companies are really the largest ones. And my prediction is that they'll mergers and acquisitions is an interesting trend that is, we're going to continue to see it. The other interesting trend that we'll probably see is the merger of uh, municipalities and, and co-ops uh, to create to gain economies of scale uh, to be able to make the investments they need to make to maintain their their grids and their in their autonomy. So now we have a couple of comments that I'd like to read through. Uh, one of them is uh, New Orleans went F W I W. New Orleans went through this municipalization face-off with Entergy New Orleans more than a decade ago. The result is that Entergy New Orleans is still owned by the IOU, but it is regulated by the New Orleans 
Louisiana City Council or the NOLA City Council. This has proven to be not at all a bad model. And do you have any comment on that, Andres? No, again, you know, we did phenomenal things at Austin Energy because we were owned by the city, and and so, you know, we could trench along the guys that were doing public works and along the guys that were doing the water and, and, and you know, share infrastructure and, and all the things are, are are leveraged, but they also get in the way, you know, we because we're a municipality, we didn't have the freedom or the flexibility of being a private company in doing things that a private company could do because we're owned by the city, so we're a government entity, we have all these constraints. So, so you know, I, again, you know, <clears throat> I don't think there is a there is a one-size-fits-all solution here, and I don't think we're advocating that. What we are advocating, though, is that a lot of people, uh, especially at the high end, the high level, don't understand the intricacies, the 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 causalities, if you will, of these disruptions. Uh, reg I'm talking about regulators, chief executive officers, chief operating officers, and, and so on of all these companies that that I don't see a purposely driven, very methodical, incredibly thought out planning process that understands all the realities, that, is, that they're, they're, these things are being tested and, and, and tried after they have been developed and, and with true strategic planning in mind, with true, you know, understanding of a go-to-market plan that is being thought through, that, that, you know, so I think that the industry lacks a lot of that and also lacks a significant amount of marketing uh, because in the end, the biggest thing of the transformation that we're seeing while we've talked about it by talking about a prosumer and talking about customers on the edge doing things, is that the customer is now at the center of the equation. Uh, it, the challenge and the vortex of all these forces uh, have an axiom by the customer. The customer is choosing. The customer can do whatever they want. Uh, and, and, that, and this creates a challenge. This creates a significant challenge to, to, the, to the industry. Uh, you know, I was just uh, uh, reading about Walmart and their um, their uh, the trial that they're doing uh, with um, you know uh, using their uh, several of their uh, distribution centers uh, and and playing with the grid and basically doing building to grid. Uh, and so, I mean, uh, think about it. I mean, this this was just written up today. Uh, where you know Walmart and Snyder Electric are testing grid to building energy interconnection, and and you know these Walmart buildings have energy storage, they have solar panels, uh, the, you know these buildings in this couple of buildings in particular in this in this story in um, uh, are generating uh, one is generating three mega megawatts, the other one is generating seven megawatts. Uh, so, you know, I, this is very interesting times, you know. Yes, it is. Uh, let's continue. Uh, uh, one question from Paul Heitman is, do you see the NRG strategy of David Crane as a way forward to DER? Yeah, I would I would say my two cents, and Manny can chime in uh, if he wants to. Uh, to my two cents is I think David Crane is right on the money. I thank him uh, profusely for sticking his neck out and getting picked on by everybody in the industry perhaps and in and, and, and some circles maybe not as popular. But I think that, you know, his company is originally a generation company. They own, the, they co-share the ownership of the nuke that we own, um, um, they, you know, the, the South Texas project, the largest uh, facility, 2,400 uh, megawatts, 2,400 yeah, 2, megawatts. Um, and um uh and in in his uh uh you know he's uh, he's bought into he bought Reliant and he's buying a couple other retail utilities he owns this company called EVgo building uh infrastructure for electric vehicles uh and he has created a bunch of divisions I'm, I'm, we're very well familiar with what they're doing and and co have collaborated in some things with them uh, I think they're they're again they're experimenting. Uh, I give him a lot of kudos for for taking the lead and becoming sort of the 
the challenging voice in the room about why should we stay put. Good. Well, excuse me. Mike Marullo asked, Erfan, I would really like to hear an answer to this earlier question, if time permits. Let's say that a lot of combo, electric, gas, and water utilities actually embrace these new power-centric business models. Where does that leave their gas and water businesses? Well, you know, again, uh, <clears throat> depending on – so so, here, so here's a paradigm shift for you that you're going to see that we haven't talked about. But let's talk about – Let's talk about DG for a moment, distributed generation. Let's talk about an old technology, combined heat and power. Combined heat and power has is, is been around for a long time and is, is, and is basically you burn gas locally at the, at the premise. Uh, you can burn propane, you can burn biofuels, but let's say you're burning natural gas and you are now basically turning the gas utility into a competitor of the power utility because the gas lines are everywhere. And the gas utility could take a DG approach to a go-to-market model to displace the centralized utility and their wires. So again, uh, the challenge of all this is that you know what makes sense is to have share infrastructure. Uh, we discussed this in, a, in 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 chapter chapter four, chapter three, and chapter seven in our in my in my book. Uh, you know, that we wrote from all the things, learnings at Austin Energy. Uh, because, you know, in some places, if you go to Provo, Utah, for example, the city of Utah uh, owns the whole thing. They own telecom, they own power, they own water, they own gas. And so the question is, if, if you could leverage all that, the capital investments, uh, in in a smart way, instead of building four trenches and four conduits and whatever, uh, if you build one and do it right, um, you know why not? You know, uh, I think it makes it makes a lot of sense, right? It's all about, in the end, I think about it's all about efficiencies. And and so, for example, there is a, the, you know, something that I want to bring up. There is a now. How many of you are familiar with uh, with uh, solar roadways? Uh, the latest craze, you know, an invention of 2006, patented by some people, some guy, a wife and a husband. And they're basically raising money right now. They're a private concern, and 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 proposing the solar roadways is basically these are solar panels that will replace the pavement, uh, and they'll be self-sustaining because they'll be powered by the sun, which is free, and they'll pay for themselves because they'll export energy back to the grid. So there's a capital investment needs to be made, but the ROI is X, Y, and Z years, and. And now all of a sudden, all the roads will generate electricity, and they can, you know, warm up if they need to. And and so again, you know, I think that you know what's what's happening is that the paradigms are changing. I mean, like take a look at Tesla. I don't know if there are any more questions, but if you take a look at Tesla, I mean, is Tesla really a car company? Is it a battery company, or are they an electric utility? You know, because when you think about it, Tesla has already 100 fast charging stations, 480 volts. All those stations are being charged off-grid with solar panels or natural gas turbines. And he offers the electricity for free to the car owners of the Tesla. And in five years, they'll have a 1,000 stations nationwide. And what prevents Tesla from selling cars or selling some other thing that needs power, right? So all of a sudden, you know, Tesla has created a parallel electric utility distribution network nationwide that can sell batteries and electricity to anybody they want to or maybe give them away to anybody they want to. That's why they can do it and not be regulated uh, as long as you buy their, their equipment, you know, a la, a la Apple, you know, premium equipment that comes with free power, you know. Interesting business model, right? Yes. So we are uh, getting to the top of the hour, so I'll try to wrap up here real quick. Uh, there are just two comments from Mike Marolo. One was that the Entergy New Orleans comment was aimed at what's going on in Boulder regarding whether they should municipalize the lift or not. And then another comment was maybe Boulder should just regulate it, not own it. Okay, thank you, Mike. And then uh, let's see if there were any final questions here. Yeah, excellent discussion. Really look forward to reading the white paper. You are the Thomas Paine of our energy revolution. 
that's from Paul <laughs> Heitman. All right, so a couple of closing remarks. First, thank you, Andres, and thank you, Mani and Bob, for your comments. Uh, one of the things I want to conclude with is that we need to maintain a very good understanding of the natural resources that are involved in producing various sources of energy and to look at the total cost of ownership of all these various sources of energy from cradle to grave. That includes the excavation, the transportation, fabrication, running the plant, maintaining it, and then retiring it and burying the stuff. We also have to get, get a good grasp of during the manufacturing process, what kinds of gases are being produced? Which one of those are actually greenhouse gases besides carbon dioxide? And what impact will they have if those, the manufacturing of those products goes to a very large extent? So many mm -hmm. things that are cutting edge innovative technologies today that look very sexy and, and show a good price point, when you start getting into the high percentage point of energy mix, there may be resource constraints there. There may be issues in, from an emissions perspective. There may be issues from grid support services perspective. This is why it's so important for utilities to remain part of this DER dialogue, because they can bring a sense of balance into it. After all, they have to provide the grid support services to all of this DER. And it's really important for us to keep a holistic picture. So we need to remain agnostic to the sources of energy and let the figure of merit be the ultimate price to the customer, the stability of the grid, and the safety that comes with that source of energy. There's no point using a source of energy that's real cheap, but every couple of weeks there's a fire that causes social problems. So as we, since we have these different skill sets in our industry, I would really welcome all of you to be part of a dialogue that looks at energy in a holistic way that allows for diversity, but maintains the overall sense of why we're doing things the way we are. And until we don't have all the stakeholders in this discussion, my fear is that a few business opportunists or ideologues or whatever there may be may drive a particular source of energy at the expense of society and at the expense of the wallets of consumers. Uh, I will have another presentation set up for you for June. I will send out a reminder on that. I really appreciate all of your participation today. I hope that through the presentation that Andres made and the comments during Q&A will motivate you to be part of this dialogue and help the utilities if you're working for one, consulting for one, or if you just have an interest to help our utility sector move into this new paradigm in a way that will keep them viable because they're critical for the stability of our grid and our national security. So with that, thank you, Andres. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Mani. I'm going to stop the recording at this point, and I will send everyone the presentation and the recording uh, within the next day or so. So with that, let me just end the recording here.